The Commonwealth has accused Karen Reed of striking her boyfriend, Boston police officer, John O'Keefe, with her car after a night of drinking and leaving him in the snow to die. The defense is saying, as they said in their opening statement, that Karen Reed was framed and this is all a cover up. So the morning of day 24, we are starting to get into the technical data that we have so been waiting for. The deep longing for cell phone data is becoming like a yearning at this point, like I am now desperately wanting. We finally got into it, and those of you that have not watched trials in their entirety before may find that some of the foundation that needs to be laid to get into the cell phone tower data, the ping data, can be a little long and slogging and technical, but we finally got some maps following where Karen Reed's cell phone went after midnight January 29th and then the early morning hours of January 29th. And we see that she is pinging or her cell phone is pinging near John O'Keefe's home by 12.39 p.m. on January 29th. And with the map, you can kind of see the route that the pings take between 34 Fairview and John O'Keefe's home. And then you see the route that the pings take the next morning as we know Karen Reed is driving to look for John O'Keefe, then over to Gemma Caves and out and around. The thing we heard for the first time is that between 12.33 a.m. and 6.03 a.m. on January 29th, Karen Reed called John O'Keefe 53 times. That is the first time we've heard about that. We also heard that the call logs show that she started calling friends and family after 4.45 a.m. and then called John O'Keefe's family after he was found. That is a lot of phone calls. That gives context, I think, to why by the time she had fallen asleep and woken back up that she was starting to panic because 53 calls is quite a lot, and that doesn't include any text messages. And I am very interested to see if we're going to get any text message data from what Karen Reed was texting John O'Keefe, because based on that phone activity, it seems that this is someone who is either perhaps still angry and is like, why aren't you answering your phone? Or then becoming stressed. Where are you? Why aren't you home? Why aren't you answering? All of us have been there where we have made repeated calls to someone wondering why they're not answering their phone for a variety of reasons. 53 calls is a lot. And from the testimony we heard in Aruba, we know that when John O'Keefe and Karen Reed have had arguments that blowing up his phone is her behavior. What do the witnesses testify that John O'Keefe said to her? Uh, Look, she's upset she's blowing up my phone. But now we need to know, are there voicemails? are their text messages. And I am hoping today we will start getting into the context of that because it's going to give a lot of context too. If she intentionally, which is one of the charges here, if she intentionally hit him with a car, why are you calling him 53 times? Don't you know where he is? Don't you know exactly where he is? Or if you drove away in anger and were frustrated and we're heading home and are like, why aren't you picking up the phone? When are you coming home? That's different. We haven't gotten to the car data yet, but those 53 calls are interesting new information this morning. And now on cross-examination, we're getting into, but why didn't you get a search warrant? And going through all the things that Trooper Tully knew when he decided not to get a search warrant. And Alan Jackson went through them fairly methodically. He said, you knew there was a shoe missing. He was invited to the home. You knew that he was out with the people that were at the home the night before. These are the things that you knew that might give a nexus to the house. There was a broken drinking glass. He was not wearing a coat. Coats could be left inside a home. You knew these things. And so Alan's really laying out, why didn't you just try to get the warrant? Why didn't you try? There's no harm, no foul. If a judge doesn't give you a warrant, then a judge makes that call, not you. And Alan's, I imagine, going to turn around and argue that later, that they didn't get the warrant because they had already decided that this was a motor vehicle collision, even though Buchanick had told the ME this might have been a physical assault. He might have gotten a glass to the face. Somebody else was saying this might have been a physical confrontation or altercation. So why not either try for the warrant or ask for consent? At the end of day 24, court ended over an hour early. She told the jury yesterday they were going to 4.30. Then at the end of the day, at 3 p.m. Eastern time, the judge said, we're on schedule. And we're going to let you go for the day. It's a beautiful day outside. The afternoon was all science witnesses talking about various types of DNA taken from various places. 
Here is my summary of that testimony. The hair found on the car was cut. The hair shaft was sent out and tested for mitochondrial DNA. It is more likely that that came from John O'Keefe. Again, is it shocking to me that John O'Keefe's DNA would be on his girlfriend's car when we knew he was in the car? No. We then went through all the DNA testing from John O'Keefe's clothing. And on the DNA from John O'Keefe's clothing, most of the other contributors, because there were different stains that had multiple contributors, sometimes two, sometimes three, all of the DNA came back to John O'Keefe, but the other contributors were generally so low quality or such a low sample amount that they could not be DNA tested. We also had another witness from a different lab, not the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab, but from a private laboratory, Bodie. And that witness testified that from the tail light, the DNA on the tail light from Karen Reed's car came back to John O'Keefe, but the testing excluded Trooper Proctor and Trooper Buchnick. So it's clear that after the defense theory that evidence was planted came up, that Trooper Buchnick and Trooper Proctor were DNA swabbed, and that DNA was sent off to the lab to test the swabs from the exterior of the tail light. And that was the end of the day today. None of those witnesses were cross-examined by the defense because again, their tests say what they say. And that is it. And there is a lot of explanations with the DNA. I don't think it is conclusive for either side other than the victim was wearing his clothes because the victim's clothes were in the snow. The victim's clothes were cut off him on, on the floor of the ambulance. The victim's clothes were on the floor of the hospital. They were bagged and dried. There are a lot of things that could have happened. The thing it does indicate to me is that all of the stains that were swabbed from John O'Keefe were not someone else's. They weren't someone else's blood or bodily fluids in any way because you would have had a higher quantity of DNA. That's about all that it was conclusive for. And we will see where we go from here. So tomorrow, will be Friday. It will be day 25. We will be going into witness like 65 or 66. And we will see if the medical examiner testifies. And if we get more cell phone data, we still don't know anything about what was going on with the defendant's cell phone. We know about the call records, but we don't know anything from a cell phone extraction. We don't know anything from the victim's cell phone extraction. We don't have any data from the defendant's car. That is a lot of critical information in this case. And we are coming up on a Friday on day 25. For deep dives into the stories that I covered here, you can find them on my YouTube channel at The Emily D. Baker and The Emily Show Podcast. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday. The podcast goes live on Wednesdays. And if you want to stay in the loop with everything I'm doing, receive the fastest notifications out there and get more Law Nerd community, join me at lawnerdapp.com, our free app for iOS and Android. 